Did you guys enjoy that this morning? Amen. Amen. Praise God. As our worship team makes their way back to their seats, let's take our copy of God's Word and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. For those of you that are visiting with us this morning, we're doing a study through the book of 1 Timothy. Uh, That is customary for our morning worship on Sunday mornings, expositional studies through whole books of the Bible. Uh, And God has us in 1 Timothy. Uh, We made our way to chapter 2 last week. Uh, I do want to introduce today's sermon by last week's sermon because they go together. Last week we covered verse 1. Today we're going to make a blazing speed uh, coverage of verse 2. So we're going to make it a long way through the chapter today. Uh, But last week Paul introduced a practical instruction for the corporate worship setting. Now that's a transition because chapter 1 was to Timothy. Chapter 2 He addresses the church, and when you come together, these are some things you need to be doing. So Timothy, instruct them to do these things. Chapter 1 had uh, defend the gospel, guard the gospel, celebrate the gospel, and use the gospel offensively to fight for what you believe in. And then chapter 2, pray the gospel. Pray evangelistically. And in verse 1, he gives us the contents of those prayers, but we're going to read verses 1 through 7 today as Paul instructs the church in corporate worship to pray for the lost souls around them and around the world. I want to invite you to stand to honor the reading of God's Word if you're able this morning. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, Paul writes these words, Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may, be lead, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus, Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Father, as we look at your word today, and your word holds ultimate authority and instruction over our lives, may we walk closer with Christ for having gone and feasted upon your word in 1 Timothy today, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So let's go back and cover what verse 1 has in it. It's uh, very briefly, it's the contents of evangelistic prayer. As you pray for lost people, what motivates that and what kind of things should you be praying for? And Paul uses uh, four descriptive terms in verse 1, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks supplications are when you look around you and you see the needs that people have. And when you see those needs, you are driven to pray for their souls. So you make supplications on their behalf. You pray over their needs, but ultimately you pray for their salvation. Secondly, the word prayers, this specific word from the Greek means things that are spoken directly to God the Father. So you make sure that as you're making these petitions, making these supplications, praying for the souls of lost people, that you are praying directly to your heavenly Father in heaven. Intercessions go a little bit deeper though. The word intercession means to put yourself in their shoes. And so as we make intercessions for people, we are relating to their lost condition by reminding ourselves that we once were lost. We were once in their condition. We were once held hostage by sin, just as they are. And so you're able to pray with compassion, and you're able to pray with with sincerity and and sensitivity to the condition that they're in. Uh, Yesterday, I got the privilege of... Uh, Yesterday was a busy day. I was in prison the first half of the day and preaching a wedding the second half of the day. Uh, So it was an exciting day. But while we were in prison uh, playing softball against the inmates at Baldwin State Prison in Milledgeville, uh, I was interacting with a lot of guys. And and every time we go in there, you know, they thank us and, and say, thank you for not forgetting about us. We call them the forgotten population 
in the U.S., uh, many of them unreached by the gospel, and we love to go in there and, and love on them with the gospel and beat them at a good game of softball, but I, I can't say what I normally say. We got beat yesterday. Uh, I normally say we went in there and we waxed them or we beat the pants off of them, but that didn't, that didn't totally happen. Uh, so they, they were pretty good. But in, in sharing the gospel with them and in speaking with them, uh, Johnny Hunt, Pastor Johnny Hunt, First Baptist Woodstock, I went to a conference on Thursday. He made a comment in his conference. It's called Moving Beyond Conference, how to lead a church beyond plateau and decline and what, what matters most. He made a comment that impacted the way I interacted with these guys yesterday. He said, you know what, honestly speaking, every one of us in this room, and it was a room full of preachers, are just one decision away from stupid. So you know what, most of the guys that I interacted with yesterday, there was only one decision between where they are and where I am. One decision. They, they made a bad choice. And, and are suffering the consequences of those actions. Is that reason not to pray for their souls and minister to their souls with the gospel of Jesus Christ? And so going there, uh, you are really faced with what God has rescued you from. His grace. We just sing about it. What has God's grace rescued me from? What has God's grace prevented in my life? Where could I be today if it weren't for that grace? And being able to minister, those are, that's all wrapped up in intercessory prayer where you put yourself in their shoes and you weep over their condition because you were once there held captive and hostage by sin in that captivity and God saved you. And then, of course, the last element that Paul gives in verse 1 is the giving of thanks. Aren't you thankful that the gospel saved you? Shouldn't you also be thankful that God has given you the charge of carrying the gospel to others? And so those are things we give thanks to in evangelistic prayer. We say, Lord, uh, I see needs all around me. I pray for their souls. Lord, I'm, I'm praying directly to you as the author of salvation, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, I was once there, and you rescued me. And Lord, I'm, I'm sensitive to where they're at and the blindness of their heart and the captivity of their sin. Free them from that. And Lord, I am so thankful that you have freed me by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and I'm thankful that you have bestowed upon me the awesome responsibility of carrying that gospel to others. Now at the end of verse 1, Paul states that evangelistic prayer should be made for all men. We should pray for all types of men, not, not segregating, not compartmentalizing society or culture or nationalities, ethnic groups, uh, but pray for all men in all parts of the world. But then he singles out one group among mankind. Look at verse 2, and this is going to be the, uh, the main part of our sermon today. Verse 2 gives us uh, a, kind of a, a, pe a peek into the scope of evangelistic prayer that nobody ought to be left out. No certain people group or no certain social status or no certain uh, societal segment ought to be left out of our evangelistic prayer. We ought to be praying for all types of men, but specifically, pray for your kings and for all who are in authority. Beginning of verse 2, pray for your kings and all who are in authority. I believe personally that Paul singled this group out because they are one of the most likely sections of our society to be left out of evangelistic prayer. As we're praying for lost people, we include our neighbors, we include our family, we include our friends, we include our classmates, we even include the groups that we hear about where church planners and missionaries are going and, and reaching them and we're praying over them and, and praying that they would be reached by the gospel. But often we forget to include our leaders, our political leaders, locally and nationally and even on a world level, that we are to pray for our kings and for all who are in authority. When praying for lo lost people, we must include them. Uh, it's no different back then to the people that Paul was writing to than it is today. There were kings, there were people in leadership that were hateful toward Christians and toward the, the Lord and, and kind of tyrannical in their leading and, and very oppressive, and they experienced that. Uh, and so we have 
a, a, a similar application today as the Ephesian church would have reacted to Paul's charge to pray evangelistically for your leaders. Uh, at best, uh, if, if they weren't praying for them, at best they may have been kind of apathetic and, and indifferent to them because they were segregated from them. But Timothy was being charged to encourage his people to pray for their leaders. Now, now think for a moment, if you know anything about history, who would they have immediately put into that position of king when Paul said that? It was the, the cruel, blaspheming Roman emperor Nero who hated Christianity, who was blasphemous toward the Lord and, and very cruel and punishing to his followers. And now Paul is telling them that they need to pray for his soul. You need to pray for Nero's salvation. Leaders were often the target of bitterness and anger, seldom the target of prayer. You know, I, I'm wondering what we might see on a national level if Christians spend as much time praying for the souls of their leaders as they do complaining about their leadership. I want you to just think about that for a moment. What if Christians devoted as much or more time to praying for the souls of their leaders as they do complaining about their leadership and, and how we disagree with them. Paul was commanding the Ephesians Christians to pray for their salvation. Now let me, let me make a, a distinction here. Uh, this is in addition to, certainly not limited to, the prayer for wisdom the prayer for justice, because I, I, I'm guilty of this, that I spend a lot of time praying for the decisions that my leaders will make, that they would be just, that they would be wise, and that those decisions would honor the Lord. I convictingly have to confess that I don't spend as much time praying for the soul of the one making those decisions. And Paul specifically says here, to pray for their salvation. We are not commanded, and, and some of you are going to react to this. I'm ready. I'm a big boy. We are not commanded in Scripture specifically to pray for their removal from office. Whether they are evil or whether we disagree with them politically, what we are commanded in Scripture is to pray for their salvation. Now you say, wait a minute now, we have a responsibility. Yes, don't vote them in. We do have a responsibility. But once they are in that position of office, our responsibility is to respect them. And here, Paul says our responsibility is to pray for their souls. We're commanded to pray for their salvation. We are to be loyal and submissive to them as long as they do not require us to disobey the Lord's commands. You say, well, show me that. Romans 13, verses 1 through 5. It says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. And then Peter adds, 1 Peter 2.17, Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. There's a, a level of respect that we are to show them, and Paul says pray for their souls. The key to changing our nation, the key to changing our community, is salvation. I uh, meditated on this statement this week. You know, the only thing that can bring real change to Washington is the gospel. How much time are we spending in praying that the gospel bring real change to Washington? that the gospel would save the soul 
of the ones making the decisions for our nation. Paul gives us some benefits of praying this way at the second half of verse 2. I want you to see that as well. There are many benefits for praying for salvation, one being salvation, you know, that God actually answers that prayer and saves the souls of those that we are lifting to him. But there's another benefit, and it's so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. A quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and and reverence. Prayer for those in authority, in authority will in turn create conditions favorable to the church's evangelistic efforts. Uh, one passage that points this out is Titus 3, verses 1 through 3, where uh, Paul writes to Titus, similar situation, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were once, uh, also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So here Paul urges us to be subject, to be eager to do good, never to slander, to be meek and considerate, because we understand that they are unredeemed sinners like we used to be. All right, you know, if, here, here's a thought that crossed my mind this week. If you truly believe in the depravity of a lost soul, then here's what you have to believe, and this is taught in Scripture, that a person apart from Christ is incapable of doing good. A person apart from Christ is incapable of doing good. They are lost in their sin, and everything they do is sin. Uh, Isaiah teaches this. In Isaiah 64, he says, Even my righteousness is filthy rags. The best I have apart from God is filthy because I don't have salvation. So, we are expecting someone who does not have Christ to make good decisions. And we're praying for those decisions. I think we're getting the cart before the horse. We're expecting Christian standards from an unbeliever. And so instead, we need to back up and we need to be on our knees pleading for the souls of our leadership. Begging the Lord to save them from their sins, that they would repent of their sins and believe on the gospel and be saved. That's what's really going to change their leadership. That's what's really going to change their sphere of influence. We ought to be continuously letting those who rule over us know that we're praying for them. Many of you were here the Sunday that we brought Senator Marty Harbin here to, to preach the word. And what a great job he did at doing that. But one thing he said is, the people at the Capitol need to know that you're praying for them. I'll tell you, I, I experienced this myself. We, several of the pastors went to the Gold Dome. We got trained on how to be a lobbyist if we ever got bored and didn't have anything to do. All right, so... Uh, no, we, we got trained on how to go up there and, and make our voice heard. Very, very positive interaction. And, and while we were there, they also trained us how to locate your representatives and how to go see them. They work for you. You know, uh, I'm getting off topic a little bit, but if the Constitution works the way it was written, you're the government, right? They need to hear from you. They need to know how you feel. They need to know what's going on and, and, and what you think about the issues that they have to address. And so we stopped by uh, all of the representatives. Monroe County has three, Susan Holmes, Robert Dickey, Alan Peake, and we have one senator, John Kennedy, and, and we went by and tried to locate all of their offices. Well, that none of them were there, but, but we were able to speak to their assistants, and, and we stopped and we prayed for Robert Dickey's assistant. We stood around, we held hands with her, we said, you know, we wanted to come and pray for him, uh, and, and we, we prayed for her in his place, and also for what she does. Well, I left my card, and we left. We're on our way back to the church, and I get a phone call from an unrecognized number. Answer it, hey, this is Representative Dickey. I heard that you stopped by our office today to pray for me, and I want to let you know there is nothing more encouraging than to know that I have people praying for me. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. Senator Marty Harbin says some of the best days that he has at the Capitol are the days when he finds out there's people praying for him. 
So don't just do it. Let them know you're doing it. It encourages them to do their job. It, it uh, creates an atmosphere for you to lead a quiet and peaceable life when you are offering those evangelistic prayers up for your leadership. Now, speaking of leading a quiet and peaceable life, it's important to look at both adjectives together. There's a reason Paul used both of these, even though they sound similar. They have two separate meanings. Quiet means absent from external disturbances. Peaceable means absent from internal disturbances. All right, so if you pray evangelistically for your leaders, you are praying for an environment where you can be free from external disturbances to practice your faith and free from internal disturbances and be able to practice at peace in all godliness and reverence. Uh, these are benefits of praying evangelistically for your leaders. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.11 says that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Now let me address something for a moment. Does this mean that you cannot stand up and speak up for what you believe in when it is a, in opposition to those in leadership? Absolutely not. We've been commanded to do that. To speak up, to, to let our voices be heard. But here's what it does do. It instructs us on how to do that. It instructs us that if you are giving yourself to praying for the souls of those in leadership, and then there comes a time for you to let them know that you're praying for their souls, for their salvation, and for their welfare, and for their decisions, and for their influence. And then you follow that with letting them know that there are some things that you strongly disagree with. How are we, are, how are we to go about doing that? Well, I'm going to tell you, if you're spending time praying for somebody you will be less likely to spend time being hateful toward them. All right, so uh, it says to do so in godliness and in reverence. Why is that so important? If I call one of my representatives, which we try to do often, all right, they, they ought to know who New Providence Baptist Church is by now, uh, whether they answer our phone calls or not. If we call them and we say, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you will trust Christ as your Savior. I'm praying that you will lean on Him in the decisions you have to make. But then I turn ugly and I lamb blast him or her with the things that I disagree with. What does that do to the testimony of Christ? Uh, one thing that Senator Marty Harbin said is when you call up there, don't be ugly. They're going to hear you out. You don't have to be ugly. We have people being ugly to us all the time. We don't need the Christians being ugly to us. So, so, so what do you do? You, you handle yourself in all godliness and reference, making sure that when you contact your leaders, you are doing so in a way that reflects positively on the testimony of Jesus Christ, not adversely or negatively on that testimony. So I'm, in, I'm inspired by verse 2 today to spend more time praying evangelistically for those in leadership. Last week, because we covered praying for lost people in general, we closed the service by getting everyone to call one name to mind that they know are lost, whether it be a family member, a classmate, a co-worker, a neighbor. And we closed the service by each person praying for that name. Today, I think it'd be very appropriate for us to do something very similar and to think of those who lead us. You know, the, the verse says uh, to pray for those, for the kings and for all who are in authority. So I made a, I made a short list. Uh, we have the president. We have the vice president. We have the Supreme Court. We have Congress. We have the governor. We have the House. We have the Senate. And then we drop to the local level. We have... Uh, county commissioners, the commission chairman. We have uh, the mayor and the city council. We have law enforcement. Let me tell you, they are out there to keep us safe, Romans 13, to be a friend of those who obey the law to enforce and, and, and keep safe against those who disobey the law. And they need our prayers. This past week was law enforcement appreciation week 
in the United States. Uh, my family took several opportunities to show law enforcement that we appreciate them. But I'm going to tell you what's very encouraging, and I know this because I hear it on a regular basis, is for them to know that we're praying for them. So when you see somebody in uniform that's enforcing the law, that holds a position of authority, as you're commanded in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, go up and say, I pray for you regularly. Unless, of course, that's not true. Then you need to start praying for them regularly so that when you see them, you can go up and tell them that. We have members of law enforcement here today, whether it be a sheriff's office, police department, uh, Georgia State Patrol, Department of Corrections. They oftentimes are, are left out of that, but a very important part of our law enforcement. And I want you to know, each one of you, well, if that describes you, would you stand up for a moment? If you serve in authority in our local government and law enforcement, would you stand? These, there's more. Yeah, so these guys need to know, yeah. They need to know that their church is praying for them. But the ones that are out there on the roads that you don't even know, they need to know that you're praying for them. And don't just pray for the general safety of our local law enforcement. Pray for their salvation. Pray that they would be reached with the gospel and that they would repent and and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And let them know that you're praying that. And so I, I want you to, uh, one, if, if you know of a name of someone in authority uh, that, that you're familiar with and you know they don't have a relationship with Christ, whether it's from what you see on the news, from what you've had personal interactions with that has revealed that to you, I want you to think of them right now. So let's, let's bow our heads. We're going to pray for our kings and for those in authority, as stated in verse 2. We're going to pray for their salvation. We're going to pray for their influence, uh, but in that order, because that is most appropriate, praying for the souls of those in authority. Father, place on our hearts today names of those in authority that do not know you, and may we lift them to you at this moment. Lord, I was convicted this week that I don't spend enough time praying for the salvation of those in leadership. I spend a lot of time praying for the decisions they make, that those decisions would honor you, but I'm, I'm asking that to be done from, from someone that doesn't know you in many cases. So Lord, uh, impress on our hearts today the desire to pray evangelistically for our leaders and to let them know that that's taking place, to, to go up to our local government and our law enforcement and to, to call or, or email uh, or visit those in state government and let them know that we're praying for them and even pray for them in person. But not just to pray for their decisions, not just to pray for their influence, not just to pray for their, their motivations, but to pray for their souls. Lord, we want to see those in positions of authority saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ because what an awesome impact they could have. And for those who are saved, they need to know that their brothers and sisters in Christ are praying for them daily to stand on truth, to stand up for truth. Help us to be encouraging when we do that, to be in, uh, in all godliness and reverence. We know that the only true change that can come to a nation or to a community uh, must come through the gospel of Jesus Christ. May it not be because we haven't prayed for it. 
Help us to pray evangelistically. Convict our hearts daily. Every time we turn on the news or open the newspaper or or hear about what's going on around our nation, remind us to pray evangelistically for our leaders. And Lord, you, you will take it from there. Only you can change the heart. We ask you to do that. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.